This year's crime statistics showed a 3.2% drop in sexual offences, but various studies have shown that depending on the locality, as few as one in nine, yes, one in nine rape cases is reported to the police. Now, according to the Rape Crisis Centre, 55% of rape survivors counselled by them had been raped by more than one offender, and of those rapes, 25% have been perpetrated by known gangs. Gender activists believe patriarchy, poverty, historical, social and gender inequality are all drivers of a high rape rate. Now, to talk to us about this and to further this discussion, we are joined by uh, Professor Copano Oratere. He's an academic scholar in the field of masculinity. A very good morning to you, Professor Copano. Thank you for joining us again on Newsroom. Good morning, Yevon. Professor, a little bit earlier we dealt with a scenario of, 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 of patriarchy, some call it, some call it uh, uh, a blesser syndrome in the northwest province. In one local municipality, 3,000 girls, most of them underage, teenage girls, were pregnant, impregnated, and the economic conditions are quite dire in, the, in this area. Uh, how, how do you view that, and, and how should we as South Africa view that kind of thing? You know, I'm, one is expected to say this is a tragedy, but it is not a tragedy. This is a farce. It's, it's beyond tragedy. Um, by this I mean that if you recall a few months earlier, there was a, a young woman in the US, I think it was at Yale University, who was raped uh, uh, while drunk. Mm. And this went on the Twitter sphere and around the world, and we were aghast, how can a, a, a man, a young man at a top university around the world do this to a young woman? Now, we're talking 3,000 young women and girls were raped. So it, it's, it's mind-boggling how you would have 3,000 mm -hmm. girls in a, in a municipality of about 100,000, 100,000, seven, mm -hmm. 107,000 uh, uh, people, about 24, 25,000 households. So this is, this is astronomical. It's farcical. And the, the failure is at different different levels. It's at the level of the household, uh, around fathers and, and parents. It's at the level of the schools and education. It's at the level of, of the police and social mm -hmm. development. So uh, all of this clearly point to some serious and pervasive failures. Uh, this, is, this is what we have. And of course, how you started this was pointing out the role of men, and in mm -hmm. particular older men around this. And clearly here we have a crisis. I, I know people who work in this area says we shouldn't be talking about a crisis of masculinity, but we absolutely have a crisis of older men exploiting young women, uh, even if they're young men. And, and this points again yeah. to a particular kind of education, an education around gender, mm. around sexual consent, around sexual education. What does it say about us here in South Africa? Because the blessing term or the term blesser has gone mainstream. We all use it now in day-to-day -day con conversation almost. And, and it's almost like it's more accepted these days. Well, once again, this, this is, this is, uh, is mind-boggling. About this, how, how do we normalize uh, a clearly a almost pathological situation? Uh, a, a condition like that, a social condition where, where we, we have normalized the fact that transactional sex based on, on one party supporting the other mm. with cell phones, with transport money, with, uh, with, uh, with other kinds of goods and, or, and, and in kind, and the other supplying sex. This is, not, this is not an ideal situation. And it is produced by conditions where, where inequalities, mm. firstly, income inequalities, economic inequalities are high. So yeah. one party has money. Uh, and in this particular uh, municipality, uh, the dependency rate is about 85%. And the unemployment rate, uh, the poverty rate is about 70% from, uh, according to Stats SA, and 43% uh, unemployment. So clearly those who are employed and they're employed well are in a position to exploit those who are unemployed. Mm. And, and, and you, you have to reverse, we have to reverse a situation mm. such as this. And the one way, of course, 
is to reduce inequalities on the basis of gender, yeah. on the basis of income, to start with. In, 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 uh, in previous discussions, uh, your, uh, the two of us, Prof, we've, we've spoken about this hyper-masculinity problem that South Africa has. Tell me a little bit about what goes through the head of a man, an older man, who engages in this kind of thing with underage girls. What drives that man to commit this kind of act, do you think? Well, let me answer the, the, the one part about it. This is, mm. this is the man. Well, as I said uh, just now, if you are in a, in, a, in a neighborhood or a community or a township where you have access to goods, you have uh, more power than, than most people, such as income, you, you earn well. And so uh, for reasons that somehow you have not worked out that you cannot, uh, because of the, the income you have because of your position, exploit other people. So this, this is, a, this is a, again, points mm. to the fact that young men in this, in this country, in this society, a number of young men are, have not had uh, quite uh, adequate parenting, if you will, adequate mm. fathering, if you will. And, and in, in that case, then they, they are still working out issues about how to be adult men. So, so, you know, we, we have also spoken, you and I, Eben, about mm. young men going to Unwalok, initiation school. And this, yeah. is, this is supposed to be a moment where you instruct young men to become, to yeah. become adult, responsible adult men. Mm. But you don't have that. You don't have that in many communities, yeah. such as Ratlu, where, where young men have basically schooled into, into manhood. But hang on, there's another part to this. The other part is, of course, if you're going only to school young men and men into the kinds of, of uh, progressive manhood where you don't exploit other uh, young women and other men who are, who are less, who are subordinate as we call them. But, but you, so you leave out young women. Young women need education. So one of the things you would want to do in a community such as this is educate the young women. If you give them power yeah. so that you equalize the relationship that they have with, with men, uh, you're already on, on, if you don't do that, you will have a situation such as this. You want to educate young women. For, uh, by the way, in, in Ratlo, uh, only about 3% uh, of people have higher education, and then 20, just around 11, no, 11% 11 of, of people have finished metric. Clearly, m many of these are young women. So you want, you want to fix the schools in the mm. community. You want young women to finish uh, metric. You want them to go to, to university, and you put them in a position yeah. to have the power that they need in, in negotiating about sex about their own bodies with men in this community mm. and around but, the world. Prof, in conclusion, I, I understand you work a lot with young boys and girls and, and, and you've led discussions with them around consent. I want to talk about consent. When you, when you interact with these, uh, with these teenage boys and girls, uh, what were your findings, what were they thinking around consent? Well, thanks for this question. I mean, this, is, this has been an, an amazing experience for me. So I have been going around and including at universities. And one of the first questions I ask is, when did you learn about sexual consent? And, and what is it? How do you understand? Where did you learn? And in, on most occasions, one or two people in a group of about 50 would say, well, we, we, we learned about this at, at high school. And so the majority Mm. of young men and women have never had a, a, a non-hierarchical dialogue around sexual consent. And of course, when we start talking about, about it, they say, we need this. We need this because at, at, at universities, but mm. also in, in many uh, other situations, they, they are taught about drunken driving. This is good. But you yeah. also want to tell them about, you know, uh, particularly in a country such as this, about sexual consent. And we ask them, I ask them, so what is it? And they give me all kinds of, of stuff that, that you already know, trust, reciprocity. But, uh, the one thing that they never mention is this word equality. Sexual consent is grounded in sexual mm. equality. If you don't have equality in a relationship, you don't have the means to say no. So you yeah. have to give the young women power. You have to teach the young men to understand that a no, the first no means a no. Yeah. Because in this conversation, people say, well, if they say no and I walk away, some young women would say things like this, you give up easily. No, we have to teach young women and men yeah that we have to be clear in the kinds of messages we communicate with each other. And this is what I've been trying to do.
Professor, thank you for joining us. Very interesting discussing this scenario with you as always. That's Professor Copano Ratele. He comes live from Cape Town. He's an academic scholar in the field of masculinity. We speak about, well, high levels of rape. We speak about teenage pregnancy, especially masculinity and consent.